to host uh, this stage of the Russian Summer School on Institutional Analysis in our school. However, here I'm with the organizing team. So during the summer school, uh, so you, you used to call us two Elenas. So the main Elena is also online. So we were really um, hoping very much to be offline for this event. And we were planning at least one stage of our school to be offline. But unfortunately, not everything in our hands. So now we are online, both me and Elena from Moscow, Elena Podkolzina. So I just want to thank all of you that you have really done a very great job, like Victor already said. So you have passed through very uh, big, uh, let's say, um, test in order to be here. So first is self-motivation, because uh, I, I understand that self-motivation is one of the key um, factor of being successful in academia. And second, of course, the quality of your research. So you have received feedback from faculty members, from the experts of the school, and you have improved your research significantly. And now we see only those participants who were successful enough in this way but also they were very much motivated and they have completed the um, papers in order to submit to the final stage of our sc summer school and to present it to the in the workshop uh, during the uh, AMEA conference that we are starting with this very important event for us. So thank you very much and I would like to give the, the screen <laughs> in, my, in our case. Uh, to Elena Podkolzina, who is the spirit of this summer school for many years, and she is the main driver, actually, of this summer school, and everybody knows that. So, Elena. Thank you, Elena. I'm also glad uh, to welcome you at the final stage of the summer school. It was, uh, this year, it was really a long marathon that uh, not uh, everyone could pass from the starting point till uh, the end. And we're happy that uh, finally we've got uh, several uh, papers that are close to the final stage. And uh, I really want uh, to thank you that uh, our faculty team also passes greatly this uh, marathon. They were supporting you from the April, from the beginning. Uh, till uh, the end, uh, the mid of September. And I really hope uh, that uh, now you could feel free and contact them at uh, any time if you want to share some ideas uh, and so on. And uh, I'm glad uh, to welcome Nick Zubanov uh, as an opening uh, session by faculty team at the last day during the AMEC conference. And I'm really uh, <laughs> happy that uh, we have a chance to have some part of line. I think that it is a great step and maybe next year we're gonna meet in a normal uh, format. So we're looking forward to this. Nick, uh, you are welcome. I hope I could see you, but it, you, uh, you are so small there. <laughs> Right. Yeah, great. It's better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, now, microphone. So um, let's let's do something with the recording to avoid uh, the echo. So much echo. I. Uh huh. I think that uh, you have two mics uh, switch on in the room. So yeah, you... there's a there's a mic switched on somewhere, or maybe in the computer. No. All right. On the computer, make sure you don't speak. No, no, no. Now it's a. Uh, Use this opportunity to switch off my phone. So your participants, let us switch our phones or put them in the silent mode. Right. 
So still, still, ah, oh, right. How about, how about me switching off my microphone? Would that make it too quiet? Let's try. So, uh, wow, that's, that's weird. So even- No, Nick, it was much better before when you were with Mike. Right. Yeah. So the the research I'm going to present today is not nearly as important as the sound suggests, right? So this is not this is not the stadium concert by Freddie Mercury and Queen the band. Uh, and I'm not a televangelist, so I'm not going to ask you to repent your sins. Um, so, so um, let, let, but do let do something with the sound, because I, I feel a little confused when I, as I speak. All right. Is it better? One, two, one, two, three, four. But sound needs to be turned on uh, for... So, final sound check. People hear me well? Very good, very good, very good. Finally, we've made it. Thank you, thank you. Well, uh, needless to say, great pleasure to, great pleasure to be here in, the, in this wonderful institution. Um, so I'm, I'm really, I'm really seriously uh, touched by uh, the, the warmth of the welcome that I've received uh, in this place. It's the, it, it, I've, I've already given a little seminar. I've already presented this paper in a little seminar and I see some participants from the previous seminar uh, here. So, uh, which is not too bad because uh, in case my presentation then was too confusing, uh, here's here's the next chance to to uh, try to make sense of it now and uh, I don't want to be between uh, uh, I don't want to, well, I don't want to be the last hurdle before the break so I think I'll just have to um, I'll just have to be quick so um, skill complementarity in production technology in new empirical evidence and implication is the topic joint work with Andrei Stajanov who also visited uh, HEC in roughly this time, uh, he left yesterday, and it's in the spirit of the summer school, uh, this work reflects a process, reflects a certain process that my author and I went through. Um, so last time we presented this, it was a revise and resubmit. Now I'm presenting it, we've, we've already received an acceptance, an acceptance decision. So that doesn't mean to say that uh, comments are comments and critical reflections are not welcome because the paper is still in the production stage and we still can make changes to the text and still can add things. Uh, so, but, right. So, so let, me, let me try to motivate this research. I can do it in the boring way. Let us estimate a production function and try to tell a story based on the regression coefficients. Uh, uh, but I can, also, I can also try to do it in a, in, a, in a more playful, less serious, but still, you know, interesting, hopefully interesting and motivating way. So imagine, imagine you have a fixed budget of cash and you need to hire two workers. 
I don't know, think about yourself as, a, as an organizer of a research lab or as a movie director or as a factory manager that produces something. So you've got two vacancies and a budget of money that you can spend on hiring workers, two workers uh, for these two vacancies. Now, you can hire uh, high quality workers who are proportionally expensive, or you can hire just capable workers who are not really stars in their profession, but then, but then they don't cost a lot. So how do you distribute this budget of money? Do you distribute it evenly between the two workers so that you will hire uh, two equally capable, equally uh, skilled, reputable and uh, productive workers? Or should you spend the lion's share of the budget hiring the most expensive and most capable worker, number one, uh, leaving just enough cash to hire a capable, uh, the, but, but least, least expensive worker too on the market. So how do you, how do you distribute this budget of money? Um, so that's, that's an interesting question. And uh, in case I run out of time, the answer to this question, which motivates research that has many other implications, um, is as in many questions in economics, it depends, right? So let's let's try a little bit. Let, let's try to uh, let's try to to uh, uh, put some structure to the answer to make it to make it slightly to make it slightly more informative. So um, what we see in the data? So in the data we see that firms do appear to hire workers of different skill level, right? So we do see that even after we control in the wage equation, even after we control for a host of uh, characteristics, um, there are substantial variations in individual wages. Um, you can think of these variations as reflecting differences in bargaining power. You can think of, these, of this variation as uh, evidence of uh, discrimination based on some statistical characteristics, even though we do control for these statistical characteristics. Uh, you can think of this uh, dispersion in wages after controlling for individual characteristics as simply noise. Uh, however, um, we think differently. And what makes us think differently is that the, there is not only differences in worker wages controlling for their characteristics, which we could have lazily attributed to noise, but what's more intriguing is that this variation appears to have a significant industry component, which means that if you do an analysis of variance of wages, or of wage dispersion, if, we, if, you, if you measure within firms wage dispersion in different industries across the economy, uh, you will see that there are industries where this wage dispersion is relatively small, and there are industries where this wage dispersion is relatively large. So, so analysis of variance suggests that about a third of the within firm conditional wage dispersion, conditional on worker characteristics, occurs at the industry level, which means that there are some industry specific factors which shape firms' decisions regarding how to split their wage budget and what sort of skill mix of workers to hire. Now, what are these industry specific factors? Now, um, the, uh, what, what happens at the industry level, right? You can think of regulation. You can think of maybe exposure to trade, right? Uh, uh, what, what we think about in this, in this work is that this is production technology. So there are different production technologies in different industries. I mean, come on, there are different production technologies even in different firms within the same industry, but, but, there, is, but there is an industry specific component to the production technology. Now, what is this component to the production technology? This has to do with the notions of skill complementarity and skill substitutability in the production function, which I will briefly touch upon. I don't think that uh, I, I have either time or need to lecture on skill complementarity. Um, but I will have a couple of slides uh, explaining, explaining what it means and how important it is for our story. Um, before I do that, here are the three research questions. The first question is descriptive. Uh, try to explain, let us try to explain the variation in within firm wage dispersion across industries. In other words, why do firms 
in some circumstances prefer to hire heterogeneous workers. So referring to my example, why do firms in some cases hire a genius and a not so genius? And why do firms in, uh, in, in other cases hire two equally capable workers uh, as capable and as expensive as their budgets allow? Now, um, the answer to this question, uh, in case I run out of time, the answer to this question is that, well, in some industries, there is skill complementarity, which favors homogeneous skill mix of the workers who are hired, whereas other industries technologically uh, are such that their production technology features skill substitutability, which means that uh, the marginal product of higher skill level actually, in, actually decreases with the skill level of the other workers because there's a significant substitution uh, uh, between the contributions of different workers to the team output. So there are complementarity and substitutability industries and firms in the complementarity industries uh, want to hire homogeneous workers to maximize their profit, whereas firms in the uh, in the in the uh, uh, skill uh, substitutability industries want to hire heterogeneous workers. Now, the the second the second research question is what are the economic origins of skill complementarity? Right. So why is it that some industries are complementary skill complementarity, whereas others are skill substitutability? Um, the, the, I'm particularly proud of this contribution. Uh, I see there's a question from Sergey, which I will be happy to address after I've presented the research questions. So uh, I think the the most the I think the most interesting part of the paper is dealing with the economic origins of skill complementarity. Um, the existing literature simply says, okay, here's a parameter, let us estimate it and interpret the value of this parameter as evidence in favor of skill complementarity or substability. What we do is we go one step further, actually several steps further and, uh, and say, well, let us try to explain why some industries are complementary, whereas others are skill substitutability by looking at the features of the production process, the physical features of the production process which may have something to do with complementarity. And it turns out that firms uh, that, uh, sorry, industries that feature skill complementarity also tend to feature more complex and more multi-process, multi-task production technologies. So more sophisticated production technology requires skill complementarity and therefore firms in industries with more complicated production technologies tend to hire workers of similar skill level as similar as their hiring uh, as as the as the capacity of their hr department allows now there are there are questions in the chat um, so um, there is there, there are questions from sergey hello sergey good to see you we we've known each other for some years so um, um, maybe they need to hire one person so yeah so of course um, um, if there is one person, then the question can be reformulated in terms of how should the skill level of one person relate to the skill level of the existing workers um, in the firm. Um, but it's not, you, you see, the, the motivating example that I used is just a motivating example. It's not really very deep, right? So if you want to hire uh, if you want, let's say you want to hire 17 persons, right? So how should the skill mix uh, of these people look like? And um, it, it, you see, it's, it's uh, the answer to the 17 person question is much more complicated than the answer to the two person question. But the, I guess the point I was trying to make is that, um, is that it's quite interesting to see that sometimes heterogeneous skill workers are hired and sometimes homogeneous skill workers are hired and we want to explain we want to explain this variation so i will definitely run out of time uh talking about the third research question what okay we found that there is complementarity and substitutability and we have also scratched the surface uh explaining trying to explain how uh, the, this feature of the production technology is related to other features of production technology. Um, so, but then the question is, so what, right? So how can we relate our findings to the existing literature? 
And um, uh, well, very briefly, I will, as I said, I'll definitely run out of time talking about it, but very briefly, um, the most interesting implication of our work, we think, is that if you want to write a general equilibrium model, if you are a macroeconomic forecaster or analyst or, I don't know, a central bank employee, um, and you want, to, you want to model the effect of some policy shocks on labor market, then if you do not allow for technological heterogeneity on the labor market, the way, we, the way we show it in the paper, if you assume that production technology is homogenous and there is no variation in skill complementarity across industries, then this model will give uh, misleading results. Or let's say can give misleading results for some constellation of the parameters as we demonstrate through policy simulations later in the paper. Um, so you're welcome to download it and uh, see the, these policy simulations if you are interested, or we can talk about them uh, uh, as part of the summer school. Now, let's move on. Uh, uh, let's move on. So, uh, yeah. Now, so let us let us sort of start addressing the first of the research questions, and let us um let us answer uh, let us ask ourselves the question how homogenous should a firm's workforce be in the optimal profit maximizing case you know suppose you have the best hr people in the world and you have a labor market without search frictions right so you can hire exactly the workers of the skill levels that you want to hire who should these workers be and uh, there are two conflicting perspectives in the literature so here's one, the so-called O-ring theory of economic development. Here's Michael Kramer uh, with his very famous uh, QGE article. Why it's called O-ring theory of economic development is because the motivating example for his theory was the disaster of the space shuttle Challenger. Um, in this disaster, the entire crew was killed. It's 1986 quite a long time ago, but it's still sort of on the people's mind. And the culprit, the reason why this shuttle exploded, uh, killing the entire crew, was um, uh, because the pieces of rubber called O-rings were not quite as well fitting to the, to the rest of the machine. So think about it, pieces of rubber don't fit, you know, never mind turbines, never mind jet engines, never mind aerodynamics, it's the O-rings, right? So says Michael Kramer, uh, if you have a production process which consists of several tasks, you optimally have to make sure that the probability of a successful task completion should be the same across the stages in the production process. This is a mathematical result which uh, lies at the foundation of the O-ring theory of economic development. And the implication for our story is that firms should hire people of similar skill level so that at all stages of the production process you have similar uh, skill of workers employed and uh, therefore similar, uh, ideally equal, probability of successful completion. And so uh, firms that uh, work under this extreme case of skill complementarity would feature a relatively low within firm wage dispersion. Um, here's a conflicting perspective uh, uh, by, by, uh, in the paper of Grossman and Maggi called Skill, Diversity and Trade, uh, right? So, and they have this, they, they, they are aware of the O-ring and they say, okay, we accept that, but there could be other cases of production technology, and their example is a movie production. So think about a movie production, um, right? So how does the best selling movie look like within a limited budget, right? So um, you want to hire star actors to play leading roles, um, but you know you don't need to hire very expensive actors to play secondary roles, right? So think about this classical Gone with the Wind movie, Right, you got Clark Gable and Vivian Lee, the top actors of the time, but you know the secondary actors were hired, sort of off the street, right? And uh, of course, it, it, they, they all became famous after this production. But the the I, I guess the production technology was uh, which was at the foundation of the success of this movie featured quite strong skill substitutabilities. 
Now, so if firms operate under skill substitutability, the observed wage dispersion should be high. Now, if you prefer, if you prefer more methodical, more micro-based approach, here are the formal definitions of skill complementarity and substitutability, which uh, uh, can be graphically illustrated by looking at the profit maximization problem uh, for firms facing uh, different uh, production functions. So how do you capture production function? You capture production function through ISOC want, right? So think about this. This is an ISOC want, this, this uh, con, concave, con, no, convex to the origin, this convex to the origin function um, uh, is, is an ISOC want. It shows the set of combinations of skill levels of worker one and worker two, which produce the same level of output. So um, if your worker number two is a genius and uh, the worker number one is not so genius, this is how much uh, the, the, uh, you will produce exactly the same amount of output as when both workers are equal skill and because it's symmetric, you've got the, the other tail uh, featuring the same idea, right? So all these are combinations of uh, skills which produce the same amount of output. Now, assuming that wages are proportional to skill level, which is the assumption that we're going to maintain in this work, um, you see that the profit maximizing combination of worker skills is such that the workers should be of the same skill level. So when you have skill complementarity, Isaac won't con convex to the origin. You want to hire. Uh, you want to hire people of the same skill level. Now, theoretically, you can also have skill substitutability. The Isaac won't concave to the origin. Then uh, your profit maximizing set of uh, workers uh, consists of uh, a genius and an idiot. Um, uh, right. So uh, you have the worker with the highest possible skill level that you can buy given your budget and you have the second worker who is the cheapest worker uh, theoretically zero but there's no one that costs zero so you of course you want to hire uh, the worker for a non-zero wage but it but, but this worker should be the the least expensive that you have on the market this would be the profit maximizing choice under skill substitutability so the next question is, OK, th these are these two theoretical possibilities. How do we link these possibilities to the data? And how should we torture the data to uh, tell us something about the prevailing production technology? And the answer to this question is, well, we need to parameterize this. Now, here's a convenient way in uh, microeconomics literature and empirical IO labor micro, actually very, very versatile approach uh, used by by many empirical researchers to describe uh, to describe uh, mm, uh, production technologies that feature skill complementarity or substitutability is to think about the production uh, is to think about the production function uh, featuring what's called constant elasticity of substitution aggregate so you are probably aware of the uh, cobb douglas production function and uh, then, of course, uh, uh, the, there are alternatives to it. And the popular alternative to Cobb Douglas is the constant elasticity of substitution production function. Now, there's also translog and other production functions, which I've forgotten the names of. Um, so, what we do is we stick to the, in our empirical approach, we stick to the Cobb Douglas production function. So, you've got this, cap uh, this capital materials and labor input. Okay, let's estimate a Cobb Douglas production function that won't take you very far as far as publication is concerned. So, the, the complication that we introduce is well, let us express the aggregate labor input, the total labor input that firms use as a constant elasticity of substitution aggre aggregate of the workers of different skill levels. So you've got uh, headcount N workers working in firm I in year T. So let's say 25 workers working in that firm. They differ in their skill level and uh, how well, how do you combine these differences in skill levels in the total output, right? So, um, and, and so the, the way to do it, which has been done before us and which we are happy to use in this research as well, 
is to use the constant elasticity of substitution aggreg uh, aggregator. So this formula, which is the sum of powers raised in the reciprocal of this power is the CES aggregator. Um, so the beauty of the CES aggregator is that it's super simple. It's probably the simplest way to think about skill complementarity empirically. Um, and what makes it so simple is uh, the, the, there is a parameter rho. It's a one parameter aggregate. And uh, you can think about estimated row. You can estimate this row from, from the data. And if your estimated row is less than one, then you conclude that the labor inputs of different workers are complements. So there is skill complementarity. Whereas if row is above one, which can also be the case, um, then, then the labor inputs of different workers are substitutes. So rho being less than one means that profit maximizing firms will choose to have workers of uh, uh, similar skill levels. Rho being above one means that firms will choose to have workers of different skill levels. Now, how can we, how can we estimate a row from the data. Well, we, we do estimate row from the data, but again, that won't take you very far in publications because this has been done before. There's a very famous paper by Iranzos, Kivardi, and Tosetti. Um, so the, these researchers, they published it in the Journal of Labor Economics, and we take a lot of inspiration from this work, and they did exactly that. So they used CS aggregator, they, they had uh, wages data, they had firm output data, so they estimated exactly the structure that I presented here. So where's the room for us? Well, the room for us is, look, if you do it on the data, if you estimate it on all the data, then you will have one value of the parameter row. So it's the Procrustean bed, if you like, of uh, empirical approach looking at uh, estimating skill complementarity, because you will get only one row for the entire economy. Whereas our, our the, the point behind our work is that you can have situations you can have contexts in which row is less than one and contexts in which row is more than one so how do you differentiate between these contexts um, the existing literature doesn't do it we do it and this is what we get uh, we 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 come up with the set of industries on which data we estimate row being less than one which means that these industries are complementarity industries where firms should profit maximize by choosing workers of similar skill levels, and they do that, the wage dispersion is significantly less in those industries. But there is also an industry group. Uh, there's also an industry group that uh, features skill substitutability. Surprise, surprise. And firms in those uh, industries, the skill substitutability industries, ha do hire workers of different skill levels because the within firm worker wage dispersion in those industries is way higher than average. Now, um, so we have an empirical data driven classification results. We do see a nice breakdown of industries into strictly complementarity and strictly substitutability industries with some industries in between. So the complementarity and substitutability industries are, uh, they, they are large industry groups. They account for about 80% of the output in manufacturing and employ about 70% of workers altogether. Um, so we also, as I advertised earlier, we uh, inquire into the economic origins of complementarity and substitutability and find that industries where technologies feature more production tasks and more complex uh, more complex jobs uh, are more likely to also have skill complementarity estimate a uh, uh, role less than one that is estimated on their data. So what data do we use? Uh, the data we use are matched firm worker data. It's a wonderful data set. Uh, it comes from uh, Statistics Denmark. These data are not in the open, they, they're not open access. You need to ask permission uh, to access these data, and uh, it has been increasingly difficult to do. Um, so, but the data set, the extract of the data set that we use in this research comes from 50 industries in the Danish manufacturing 
Uh, the observations are a bit old between 1995 and 2007, so here's a sort of a little bit of economic history for you, but good enough for our purposes. We, uh, the beauty of these data is that you have firm data, but also the worker data linked to the firms. That's the beauty of it, right? You can do it in Russia as well, um, given the increasing uh, increasing complexity of statistical databases which are kept by, by Russian authorities. This can also be done. So Statistics Denmark did it and um, uh, we, we are happy to use these data. Now, so what it gives us is the possibility to measure worker skill level, which we proxy with the uh, wage equation that we estimate. Um, and it also gives us the possibility to link uh, worker skill distribution to firms output and thereby estimate the parameter row of skill complementarity differently for different industries. Now, we also have additional and alternative measures of skill complementarity, which come from which come from the database maintained by the Occupational Information Network. Occupational Information Network is a United States database which, uh, which collects job descriptions. It, it, it catalogs different jobs. Um, uh, so the, the, uh, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, and for each of, uh, for each of the jobs, it has uh, various descriptors, you know, how physically hard this job is, does it require interaction, the, how, what education does the, what education level this job requires. So there are a lot of descriptors for each job. And we use the descriptors that have been linked with the notion of skill complementarity in the previous literature. So here's a work by uh, Matilde Bombardini. Um, and associates in economic in American Economic Review 2012, which pioneered the use of uh, occupational information network data to think about skill complementarity. So what we did is we uh, downloaded the ONET data by job, and then we aggregated these ODENT data by industry, so we can have the industry average proxy of skill complementarity, um, which we use in the later analysis. So this. Uh, extremely highly visible and informative table shows you descriptive statistics and I'm sure if you have questions about it I'll be happy to guide you through it um, but for the lack of time I, I guess I should just get going um, the only thing I'm going to say is that this is really a wonderful complex complicated and rich data set that allows us to do very fine estimations of our production function parameters now, speaking of which, speaking of which, so uh, this is the main equation we estimate. So what we want to do is we want to estimate a cop douglas production function. So you see these uh, in log forms. This is what you do when you estimate a cop douglas production function, but we don't want to estimate only the cop douglas production function. What we really want to estimate is the row, is the parameter, of, uh, is the parameter that informs us about whether it's skill complementarity or skill substitutability. Um, this is a mildly nonlinear equation, no big deal estimating it at all, uh, no problem, but we, we don't want just one row for all industries, we actually want to break down the set of industries into the groups with uh, different rows. Uh, right, so we want to estimate at least two rows on uh, on the set of industries that we that we employ. So uh, the econometric technique to do so is called threshold regression. Uh, it was pioneered by Bruce Hansen, and actually in our joint work with uh, Yelena Shakina and Sofia Paklina, we use exactly uh, exactly this estimator. So what the threshold regression does is it's um, so that's how it works. You have uh, you you break this the sample of your data into uh, different complementary parts, and it's it's a data driven procedure, right? So you you have a sample of uh, I don't know, let's say fifty industries, and you break this sample of fifty industries into subsamples, you know, of let's say five and 45 industries, uh, six and 44 industries. So you, move, you, you break it into subsamples. You estimate separate rows on the subsamples of industries 
and um, you choose the breakdown of the industries that maximizes the fit to the data. So that's where the procedure stops. And that gives you the two values of the skill complementarity parameter row. Um, and so it also gives you the subsamples of industries that feature uh, different values of row. Now, how do you test for technological heterogeneity? Uh, between these industries, well, you test the nil hypothesis that uh, the row in one industry subsample is the same as the row in the other industry subsample. Now, let me tell you that this hypothesis fails miserably, and our data suggests from specification to specification that, uh, that industries are actually quite different in terms of skill complementarity. Um, these are some pictures from threshold regression procedure in case people have uh, questions about the procedure itself. Um, let me move on to show you another very readable and self-explanatory table. Um, so what it shows is um, what it shows are the estimates of the row in different subsamples of industries in 40 specifications that we tried you know we 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 ran just one production function equation but we used a lot of specifications for this equation what is a specification well a specification has to do with how we measure skill we have four measures of skill with how we measure with which proxy for skill complementarity we use in the onet data to guide the grid search in the threshold regression procedure there are uh, how many? Five. Yes, five different measures of complementarity that makes already 20 specifications. And uh, we also use the uh, we also use the standard nonlinear least squares estimator to estimate the production function. And we also use fancier um, uh, approach to estimating production function, which is based on the idea of control function. And what it does is it controls for possible uh, endogeneity of factor inputs in the production function. So we've got a total of 40 specifications, and you see that you've got on one subsample, you've got rows in all specifications, you've got rows way above one. On the other subsample, you've got rows way beyond one. And you see that for the majority of specs, the difference between the rows on the subsamples is significant. Right, which means for us that uh, that you've got two industry groups, or uh, let me be careful, you've got at least two industry groups, which is different in terms of the degree of skill complementarity. Uh, you've got the complementarity and substitutability industry groups. The story is actually slightly more interesting than that because depending on the spec, uh, you've got an in, an in, a given industry can be in the complementarity group, meaning row less than one, but it can also be in the substitutability group, meaning a row more than one, because you know statistical estimates they vary, and the position of an industry in the groups also vary from spec to spec. But um, you know, given the number of different specs that we try, our classification of industries into the complementarity versus substitutability group, I would argue, is pretty stable. So you've got 15 industries which are almost never in the complementarity group. So these industries, these 15 industries, they feature row way above one. So these are the substitutability industries. You've got 15 industries which are almost always in the complementarity group. And look, they feature strong skill complementarity. And there are 20 industries which are sometimes in the complementarity, other times in the substitutability group, depending on uh, which specification we try, and their estimates are somewhere in between. So we thought, well, I, I guess, the the correct representation of our result is that you've got skill neutrality group, skill substitutability group, and skill complementarity group. So in the skill neutrality group, row is equal to one, uh, meaning that it doesn't really matter. Uh, the structure of skill level of workers in your production function, as long as you hire workers of a given total skill level, it doesn't matter how you distribute it across the workers, and there are such industries as well. 
So what are the examples? I guess you would be interested to see what examples of complementarity and substitutability and sort of try to relate them to um, uh, the, some preconceptions that people may have about the production process in those industries. So the industries which are always in the complementarity group quite strongly are chemicals, pharmaceuticals, IT equipment, and fine measurement equipment. So we are talking about high tech, high value added, high R&D intensive industries, which are skill complementarity. Now, if you want to be successful in those industries, you have to make sure that you hire workers of similar skill levels across the production procedures, right? So um, if you are producing a pharmaceutical, if, you, if, you're making, if you're making a COVID vaccine, you want to hire great biochemists to make the vaccine. You want to hire great logisticians to make sure that the vaccine is delivered um, to, to the vaccination points. You want to hire great PR people to convince people that this vaccine is, 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 worth, is worth taking in, um, right? So uh, if, you, if you screw up at one of the stages in this production process, then you will screw up completely. So this is, of course, very, very stylized, but uh, I guess, um, and equally, if you're making a computer, Right. So if you uh, if you if you have a wonderful processor, but screw up in graphics, for example, or uh, other functions of the computer, it, it won't work. Uh, now, examples of substitutability industries are textiles, publishing and printing. I don't think I have as convincing a story about these industries, why they are skill substitutability, but statistically, statistically they are. So uh, in uh, textiles, um, you want to hire great designers uh, and have your garments uh, produced in Bangladesh, right? In appalling conditions, never mind, they'll buy it. You just put a nice labels on them and uh, everything will be okay. So do buy, do buy environmentally and human rights aware clothing is one implication. Uh, this is very serious, but this is not what follows from our study, right? So, uh, but this is just, it's just, a, it's just a sort of, it's just a sort of reflection on uh, the technological heterogeneity across industries. Now, but more interesting and more serious question, I think I'll finish with that one is, well, why is it that some industries are complementarity and other industries are substitutability? The existing research says, well, look, uh, because they have different roles, but, but, but this, is not, this is not a satisfactory answer to the question. Uh, why, why, why do they have different roles, right? So, and so we try to, we try to scratch the surface. I think, it, I think this is a potentially interesting area for further research. Um, um, so let's sort of begin exploring. Um, let's think about the O-ring theory of economic development, right? So let's take this Michael Kramer's perspective and see whether we can develop it to try to explain uh, the origins of skill complementarity. In Michael Kramer's uh, O-ring theory of economic development, you, ha you have output modeled as a function. So this is not exactly how output is modeled, but the output is uh, a function of uh, the n different stages of the production process and the total success of production at each stage of the process, right? So if the probability of a successful completion of the production task is S, then uh, the probability of a successful completion of the entire production process is a product of individual probabilities. So that's, that's the theory. That's the theory. And as you can see, this features very strong skill complementarity. Why? Well, you, uh, if, you, if you take the cross elasticity, sorry, if, uh, derivative, of course, if you take a cross derivative uh, of uh, the output with respect to skill levels of different workers controlling for different stages, of the production process, you will you will see that this is positive, and it increases with the number of production processes, and it also increases with other characteristics that we proxy. But the key first order parameter here is the number of production stages, production tasks, production process involved in the uh, production of the final good. The more stages you've got, 
the more strong complementarity uh, the this technology features. So this is probably the main insight that I'm going to present here. There are other more minor insights which we can discuss if time allows, but I don't think time will allow. Um, so then the question is, well, how do you um, how do you proxy for the number of production tasks? And our proxy for the number of production tasks is uh, a very old proxy used in the I.O. literature since late 60s. The Herfindahl-Hirschman concentration index. Everybody knows what Herfindahl-Hirschman concentration index is, right? So uh, it's used as a measure of the effective number of competitors in the industry. Well, um, the, of course, the, it's the inverse of the Herfindahl-Hirschman that is used as a measure of uh, effective number of competitors in the industry. So we use this idea and uh, creatively applied it in our research. It has nothing to do with competition, but uh, the Herfindahl-Hirschman is theoretically founded measure and it's very nice to work with. It's very uh, easy to calculate and it makes total, it makes total sense. So um, uh, in, in another well-presented table, uh, we see that uh, in all our specifications where we regress the likelihood for an industry uh, to be in the skill complementarity group based on our industrial classification, um, for each industry, we calculate the frequency of uh, being in the complementarity group, and then we regress this frequency on uh, the number of production tasks and other proxies for the uh, for the skill complementarity across the tasks that we came up with theoretically. The most important predictor, uh, uh, which is there in whatever specification we try, is the number of production tasks. Industries with a larger number of production tasks are more likely to be in the skill complementarity group. Why? Because for these industries, more things can go wrong between the start of the production process and the realization of the final output. Because more things can go wrong for these guys, they want to hire people of similar ability level to make sure that the probability of success of their production process is the highest possible. So this is a very, very simple economic story. Now, of course, we go beyond and uh, use other controls. And of these other controls, the most important is what we call occupational task complexity. This is another measure coming from the ONET data. And we see that industries that are higher in terms of occupational task complexity are also more likely to be in the complementarity group, which again, makes sense. So um, uh, let's see if there are questions in the chat. Uh, there are no questions in the chat yet, so please do ask your questions. I'm happy to take them on the go. I'm also happy to take them after the end of my presentation. Um, I guess these are already addressed. So, um, yeah, and as I said, um, as I said, the third research question is what, what's the big deal? The big deal is that if you write down a general equilibrium model trying to predict labor market consequences of a given shock in the skill structure of your labor force, so think about migration, for example, or an educational reform, then if you fail to account for skill complementarity differences across industries, the model predictions, as these very user-friendly slides suggest, are going to be are going to be quite different from the truth. So um, we therefore recommend policy analysts and policy makers to uh, take uh, differences in skill complementarities across industries into account and uh, propose some ways of uh, easily doing so in uh, policy simulations. So uh, thank you very much for hosting me here. It's a great pleasure and a great privilege, and I'm open to, I'm open to your challenging and tricky questions. Thank you. Sergey has a question. Yeah, hi. Um, I guess my question is, um, why do you hire a person with whom you have a negative uh, substitution? 
factor. Like if you don't hire somebody, right? You have like a minus infinity uh, effort from not a hired person, right? So your effort should go up very high. Like mm. what, 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 who forces me to hire this additional person? Ah, I see. I see. Maybe I misunderstood your earlier question. Right, right, right. This is tricky. <laughs> so uh, I don't really have a I don't really have a good answer to your question. Let me be very honest to it. Right. So uh, we we go we so yeah. So so my understanding of Sergey's question is: Imagine you have skill substitutability. And uh, what this means is that you want to maximize the uh, difference in skill levels, right? So, and so the logical implication is that instead of hiring two workers, you should hire one worker, keeping the other imaginary worker of skill level zero. That's the, that's the, best, that's the best you can do, right? So why then do you hire two workers uh, instead of one worker? Why, why do you feel compelled to fill all the vacancies? I don't really have a question, an answer to this question within the uh, empirical approach that we're using. So think about think about some or some constraints, right? So why why do you why do you have uh, why do you why do you have a position for this worker, right? If there is nothing that this worker uh, can do, then there will be no position. And uh, you will indeed not have to hire this worker. Uh, so, nice question. This, no, it's not nice question. It's a terrible question. But it's it's, it's, a, it's a very very it's a very tricky question for which I uh, for which I thank Sergey. So my there only answer to it. There is a paper you can it, cite about it. Excuse me. There is a paper you can cite about it. There is a paper I can cite about it. Yes. Uh huh. Could you? 2013 could, could you could you would you be so kind to i have like five published papers it's one of them <laughs> so uh i guess my point is uh what it says is that there is a substitution story uh -huh. and there is a story of productivity of an additional workplace so you hire yeah. a person because that increases the productivity of those who are already working because an additional person no matter whom you hire increases that but right. If you hire a smart person on that place, he hurts other people because other people stop, stop, stop work as much. So ah. there is like a little bit more deeper than that. So we are looking at optimal team composition, like how many people have you, do you have to hire? Right. That's one of the stories that come out of that. I'll send you a link, but like I have, if I forget, I have like five papers and that's one of them. Teamwork competition. Team right. Company. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, you know, I, 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 I uh, thank you. I'll, I'll definitely, I'll definitely do that. Uh, thank you. So indeed. So why do you, why do you hire an additional person? Because holding the average skill level constant, hiring an additional person would increase the physical volume of labor input, right? And uh, labor inputs will increase the total output. So there is a marginal, there is a, a non-zero marginal benefit of hiring an additional person. Now there is an additional variation in this marginal benefit depending on the skill composition, which is the story that we are uh, addressing. But thank you. So we, we do control, of course, for the total labor input for the headcount. So our results are not going to be affected by uh, this consideration. But, but, but thanks. Thanks anyway for for it. And I'll be happy to consult this literature and cite it in the remaining days in, uh, during the production process. So there is, uh, there is another question. Uh, uh, yes. Hi, Nick. Paola. Paola. Yes. Hello, Paola. Yes, I also wrote something in the chat. I try to sum up. So, if I understood well, uh, you um, you focus on all this uh, choice by the firm about different skills, different skills, uh, this different wo worker with different skills. But uh, um, uh, obviously, you cannot do everything. But uh, uh, do you have a way to consider? competition for uh, uh, skills, for um, different skills, uh, skilled uh, workers 
in the sector the firm is uh, the firms the firm belong to because uh, it could be that the choice of having uh, uh, a more skilled or a less skilled uh, uh, worker to hire a less skilled or higher skilled worker can also be affected by the competition in the sector so for instance you have uh, in some uh, in some sector that firm firms they strategically uh, try to have uh, less skilled workers they uh, you know they invest in this uh, in these workers and then uh, they try to uh, you know uh, to have them for uh, or their their life uh, uh, in their working life in that firm because uh, to high to hire a skilled worker is uh, too costly or because there are some uh, you know uh, strategic uh, production uh Right. Yes. So we did try to account for strategic behavior of firms in mm -hmm. uh, hiring. Um, we we tried it. We this project in the early stage uh, in the earlier stages of this project. This project was a lot more theoretical than it ended up being. We we tried to develop uh, we tried to develop a model that would allocate workers from a certain distribution of skill to firms uh, from a certain distribution of uh, productivity level, right? So if you allow for firm heterogeneity, mm -hmm. um, so there are productive firms and less productive firms, the firms that have more cash and firms that have less cash, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and try to see how the allocation process will look like in the presence of skill complementarity and substitutability that was very very ambitious we actually failed to uh, uh, come up with a tractable model of such mm -hmm. allocation in the presence of skill complementarity so there is not much we can say uh, algebraically about how the optimal skill mix profit maximizing skill mix should exactly look like in the presence of other firms competing for labor on the same market, right? It's a very, very complicated, it's a very relevant question and a very, very complicated problem. So imagine you've got, uh, you've got firms that, say you've got two workers, you, say you've got two firms and four yeah. workers, it's the simplest case you can think of, uh, mm -hmm. to think about strategic behaviors. You've got two, wor two firms and four workers and workers differ in terms of productivity and firms also differ in terms of their amount of money that they can cough up to hire these workers. Um, um, so uh, how would these workers be allocated across firms? Um, let's say you've got skill substitutability. So the most productive firm will want to hire the most productive worker and the least productive worker. And the, the least productive firm will have two workers in between. And under some constellation of parameters, it does seem to be the case um, so when you have skill complementarity, you want to uh, you want firms to hire workers of similar skill levels. So it's worker one, two in one firm and worker three, four in the other firm. But then the, you have complications because the spacings in the productivity distribution uh, may be different uh, when you have when you think about productivity distribution of workers and productivity distribution of firms. So we've had a couple of micro theory seminars with more knowledgeable colleagues trying to get this model going and unfortunately we failed to get this model going the only thing we did, we managed to do is uh come up with a computational with a computable uh a general equilibrium model through simulations uh, that shows that the effects are roughly the same so if you have skill complementarity you will have uh a greater compression of skill level within firms than when you have skill substitutability. But of course, because of competition on the labor market, even in the theoretical case, uh, the results are going to be blurry. No one is going to hire the best worker and the least good worker on the market you've got uh, in in the universal case so we're only capturing in this empirical analysis we are only capturing the uh, the, the tendency that does seem to show in our 
simulations of a general equilibrium model, but we do not have uh, a strong tractable algebraic result that shows exactly how workers of different ability levels will be allocated across firms of different productivities. So very, very relevant question. Uh, we tried our best to address it, but uh, you know, but but we we had to abandon this prospect facing unsurmountable modeling difficulties. Thank you very much. Maybe an idea from the empirical point of view could be to include somehow the uh, the dispersion of wages in that sector because uh, uh, it could be a way to um, uh, let's say to uh, include uh, the, um, um, the the how much uh, uh, workers can try to find a better job in terms of a salary um and this will not capture complementarity or but uh, will give you an idea of uh, you know the opportunity of workers to you know to move around in the same sector maybe but from the empirical point of view i do understand that from the theoretical point of view is really really uh, difficult and maybe impossible yes thank you in any case thank you very much um thank you for your suggestion paula um I wish we could do more with the data. Our access to the data has been terminated by our friends from Statistics Denmark. Uh, so, so unfortunately, uh, um, uh, we. So we, we. It's not that I will disregard your comment. Uh, we just cannot address it at this point on this data set. Um, but what we do is which is sort of a flavor, which is in the spirit of the approach you're proposing. What we do already is we control for, uh, of course, we control for firm fixed effects in our approach. And uh, these firm fixed effects will suck up whatever industry heterogeneity there is, including uh, industry heterogeneity in terms of uh, wage dispersion, which we find to be important. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my question is, I think, to some point related to what Sergey has asked. So we uh, understand that um, industries and like jobs specifically it can be different based on average time needed to find an appropriate person. So sometimes for companies, maybe uh, it is more valuable to wait for an appropriate person rather than hire someone who has, um, like you've said, not complementary skills. So if we are somehow to consider, like in some industries, like the positions could be vacant for half a year or a year until a person is found on the market. So maybe this could also be an explanation why some industries like the ones that you mentioned is, if I'm not mistaken, the majority of people that you've analyzed are either from medium or high position. There were not many from low positions and like low level specialists in terms of distribution that you've shown. Maybe I'm mistaken. The stable was not <laughs> really big, but that could also somehow impact. So maybe it's like less expensive to wait than to add one person. Uh, who is not complementary. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so indeed, the, 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 my, my interpretation of your point is that um, it could be that firms will compromise on the profit maximizing set of worker of different skills that they would ideally have for the sake of filling vacancies with whoever comes up quick, right? So uh, yeah, um, the, the, these search frictions are not the factor that we consider. Um, and it's not that it's not important, it is important. We just, our, our little model doesn't, we, we, so 
Um, what we can say, however, to address this point is that, well, first of all, we, we, we control for the, for the worker headcount, right? So, and we use yearly data. So our data being not so high frequency, I think, you know, the, the search frictions that exist, I, I don't think that they will, I, I don't think that a lot of vacancies uh, come unfilled uh, in, in the uh, oh no 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 sorry sorry uh, uh, no that that's not that's not a defense that's not a defense because if you have a vacancy being unfilled for a long time uh, you will fill it earlier than a year of course but you will fill it with a not an optimal worker given the skill level of the other workers so okay here's our second point to to address this. Uh, and we actually think about a similar phenomenon, not the same, a similar point in the text already. We, we think, well, uh, what could be reasons for the observed wage, for, for the observed skill mix in a given firm to differ from the profit maximizing skill mix? And there are lots of reasons. One of them we already discussed uh, with uh, Paola, right? So you've got, when you have heterogeneous firms competing on the labor market, the actual skill mix that the firm employs will be a, a function not only of the production technology, but also of the competition on the labor market. Um, so your point is, uh, so is, is, is related uh, in that uh, the optimal the, the observed skill mix can differ from the optimal because uh, the firms need to fill vacancies and they don't find workers. So what this means econometrically, econometrically it means that our observed measure of skill dispersion will be measured with error as compared to the optimal profit maximizing measure of skill dispersion. So the presence of measurement error in our specification will bias the estimates of rho towards one. So this is the so-called attenuation bias in the regression equation through because of the measurement error. So actually, in that sense, our results, I would say, in a way conservative, because we do find the rows estimated on mismeasured data to be quite different from each other. So which means that given that our data are measured with error and there are all sorts of frictions and inefficiencies that deviate the observed from the profit maximizing, if only we could see the profit maximizing skill mixes, the implied rows would be even more different from each other. So thank you for <laughs> uh, giving us this uh, point, which actually is advantageous for us. Now, of course, not all uh, not all uh, differences in uh, the observed skill mix uh, from uh, the profit maximizing skill mix are measurement error in the classical sense. Think about wage compression because of institutional factors like trade unions, for example, or collective bargaining agreements, right? So you've got, let's say you, let's say, you know, you, you, you have a catering business and you hire cooks that make the food, right? So there is a collective bargaining agreement which says that a cook should earn so much money, regardless of how good this cook is, right? So you will have a, you will have a depressed wage compression, and as a result, an overestimate of row. So that would that would put the rows farther apart from each other than what we than than the unbiased estimates would imply. That's a greater danger uh, uh, to, to our story, which we also try to address to the best of our ability. But thanks for, thanks for thinking very seriously about the, the measurement issues. There are lots of measurement issues in this approach. This, uh, it's, um, no matter how hard we try it, it's still very stylized and not, not as deep as we would have loved to have. But it's, it's, a, first, it's a first attempt. Let's see what happens. I also have small question, may I? Please. Uh, uh, so um, your arguments about uh, the industries uh, where the skills com complementarity uh, should be more widespread is quite similar to the arguments of transaction cost economics approach of, to explain uh, when uh, the firm should uh, produce something inside then to outsource. 
would we say that you could transform not from industrial level, but to the firm level, saying that the firms that need to produce majority of, to, to put the majority of the production cycle inside the firm will use more skilled complementarity strategy than substitution one? So, uh, yeah, the nexus between uh, the uh, allocation of production and skill complementarity. So, so your, your theory is that firms that outsource would uh, hire more uh, homogenous workers to themselves. No, the opposite. No, the other way. Oh, so firms that outsource will hire more heterogeneous workers. Yes. Uh, right. Why, 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 why would it be the case? Um, by workers, we mean people who work in those firms rather than the people who work in the outsourced facilities, because the outsourced facilities are, um, uh, they, they, they come as different workplaces in our data. So I, I, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to understand why firms that outsource would hire more heterogeneous workers. Because uh, just uh, following uh, your example, they could, um, uh, when you outsource, uh, your, mm -hmm. it, is it easy to control what you are outsourcing and you couldn't worry about the skills? and what you are trying to keep inside, you are worrying more about the skills. And uh, uh, that's why these, what you are seeing could be the, uh, it's not the industry characteristics, but the characteristics of the firms that prevail in the industry. Mm. Yeah, and, now I understand. And, and maybe, maybe it is uh, due, for example, to the country specific, because you're using uh, uh, data from one country, as I understand, and the firms are established in Denmark, or you have some heterogeneity of the firms. Yeah, uh, we haven't we haven't really thought about we haven't really thought about this this aspect. Uh, I must say, uh, the only the, the and and the, the the only the only thing I can say right now, I'll I'll think more about it. So, uh, but right now, the only thing I can say about it is that when you do outsourcing, so I, I want to run with your example. So, so when you do outsourcing, how does this outsourcing look like on your balance sheet? The data from which we use in our analysis. When you outsource the production to another firm, the costs of production that this other firm bills you come as the costs of materials on your balance sheet, right? So your labor costs, and therefore all our measures of skill and skill dispersion, they come from the workers employed at your firm, rather than the workers employed at the firms to whom you outsource. So in this sense, in this sense, you can have different options. In this sense, you can actually have skill, skill complementarity rather than skill substability. So you want to hire very good workers and similar skill workers to work with the stuff from outsourced firms. Uh, but they, they, can also, they can also be substability. The, 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 the point is interesting. I, I, I need to think about it. I need to write down a little model to try to think about it. So let's talk, let's talk later. Let, let's think about more, more, more about it later. But, okay. but thanks, thanks, for, thanks for your point, Irina. Okay. Uh, uh, please join me in thanking the Nick for such thought provocative presentation. And I believe you are welcome to discuss it later on with him during the day or send the emails and uh, we are opening to the further collaboration. Now we have a short break till 11 and then we will keep on with the presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao.